Our first case today is a gentleman who's 59 year old married male who uh, just got himself a golden doodle. So he's enamored with our um, mascot dog and therapy dog here. Uh, and so he's very excited about coming to visit because of the dogs. He is a gentleman who has a history of hypertension and uh, we actually did an echocardiogram and we'll talk more about that in a minute. He has increased cholesterol. He was asymptomatic and it's very tempting to take somebody with hypertension who's asymptomatic and put him on a treadmill and do a spec scan, especially if you can make $4,000 a day if you do tw uh, 12 of them in a day and you own the equipment. And so he had that uh, in a practice that's very committed to having spec scans. As a matter of fact, they have two of them in the office that uh, are digi-rad, that uh, you sit in a chair and it makes pictures. And so this patient uh, was asymptomatic and then had a positive spec scan. I don't know where the area of positivity is, but uh, as you know, the spec scan has a 40% false positive, 65% false negative, and then he had a cardiac cath and they found some blockages here and there, one in the right, one in the LED, and asymptomatic. And so the, there's something called the optico-kinetic reflex that prompts you, if you see those, to put stents in. And so, uh, so he had two stents put in those lesions, which may or may not have been related to the spec scan uh, in an asymptomatic male. And that was in January 2012. And so then he was followed thereafter with yearly spec scans, which are 18 to 22 millisieverts of radiation. He got uh, 18 millisieverts, say, at the lowest uh, from the first part. And then from the cath, then you get five, and then you pick up another uh, 15 or 20 or 25, depending upon how long it took to put the stents in and then another 18 to 22 yearly. So we've got a robust radiation experience going cumulatively. And as you know, the effects of radiation are cumulative. And so we're talking about, is there value added when you have a patient who has been totally committed to spec scanning in a practice? His uh, insurance didn't cover him anymore where he was. And so he moved uh, to our practice, which is a CT-based practice. So let's see what difference this might make and if there's any value added. And I would like to submit that to you to see if you think there's any value added. So uh, his physical exam showed that he was a pretty hefty guy at 240. BMI was uh, 35.4, which qualifies for obesity. Blood pressure was controlled okay. So you say, oh, that's great. He's got a good blood pressure. Uh, he has hypertension. His blood pressure is under control. But then we did see he has a little LVH with a wall thickness of 13. How can his blood pressure be under control if we have sort of a longitudinal information that you get from LVH from an echo? It's like you would say hemoglobin A1C is to diabetes as LVH is to echo, or as wall thickness is to echo. And so that would be a good analogy. So here's his medications. Well, let's see. He had the stents in 2012. Uh, how come he's still on Plavix? And so I don't know. I guess uh, the use of DAPT, D-A-P-T, which is dual antiplatelet therapy, has been studied extensively. There are guidelines, and it used to be um, six months to a year. Uh, now the guidelines are on a regular case without thrombosis, three to six months of dual antiplatelet therapy. If you have uh, thrombosis, then we're talking up to th uh, certainly a year, up to 30 months has been studied. And so this gentleman didn't have thrombosis, and... Uh, it's been four years and he's still on his Plavix. So there is risk but no benefit. He's also on aspirin 81 milligrams, which isn't usually considered by the patient a drug, so they don't list it on their medications. But he, uh, he takes it PRN. I don't know what that means. And so I didn't put it on here because it's 
pretty unreliable how often he takes it. We um, sometimes survey the Plavix uh, and the effectiveness of that. We have a test called the Verify Now. We used to have a test called the Verify Now test. It's an $8,000 countertop machine that you can direct a patient who's on Plavix to get the test. You can't hold the blood. You've got to test it right away. Uh, you get it and you test it and you get a number and it tells you the percent of platelet inhibition. Apparently, we don't have that anymore. The hospital sold it. It was on the countertop over there in the lab, and the lab sort of decentral is centralizing, and so they're sending stuff out. You can't send that out, but uh, somehow the machine went over to Biomechanical, and they sold it. I don't know how much they got for it. So we got to send our patient to Tampa General now to get the Verify Now test, uh, and uh, that's what we did yesterday because we didn't have any more. I was really amazed. So uh, EKG shows nonspecific T wave changes and ST changes, very common, more common in females, but very common in males. Doesn't mean anything. It's a, it's a nothing diagnosis because it's not actionable. And so we have a lot of EKG readings that are not actionable information like left atrial enlargement or which has a low specificity but a high sensitivity uh, and nonspecific ST T wave changes, nonspecific T wave changes, all that stuff is uh, unactionable information that we uh, supply. And then we did a CIMT, which is basically we want to know about the thickness of this carotid artery, but we don't have to know about the thickness because he's got big chunks in there. So we're looking to see if there's subtle uh, progression of atherosclerosis in the vessel by causing the lining of the carotid artery. This is the carotid bulb where it bifurcates the lining of it to increase and get thicker. But well, we don't have to, we don't need anything subtle like that when you've got like a big iceberg sitting in here. And so we got two big chunks. And so this one looks pretty calcified and then uh, not calcified here. This one uh, is not so calcified. The net, we follow these. The natural history is to move towards calcification and shrinkage, which uh, some people used to call that regression of coronary atherosclerosis. And, uh, but I call it shrinkage because basically the lipid content becomes fibrotic and then calcified. And as the water draws out of that, then it becomes smaller. And as you know, scars contract. And so we see shrinkage of the lesion rather than regression of the lesion. So he still has active disease in that you know, this plaque down here is not calcified. It's not near as dense. And so he's got stuff going on with his lipids, despite the fact that we found he's on Crestor 40 milligrams, which is the maximal dose. He's on Losartan. It's always interesting to look at these medications. Uh, Nifedical very frequently causes uh, peripheral edema. And so I don't use it as much as I used to because everybody seems to come up with peripheral edema. Losartan is a six-hour drug, and so not a very good drug for treating hypertension. So the blood pressure that he had when he came here is probably being influenced by his Losartan. Uh, and so we don't know. And this is probably a long-acting nephetical. This is short-acting. So we don't know if this is really his blood pressure or just the blood pressure uh, within the six hours of having taken his Losartan. So we got lots of things to look at as we go down here, uh, having previewed his drugs. And so this demonstrates, and you can't see it very well, that his LV is thickened because uh, the wall thickness is 13, and uh, 11, 9 to 11 is normal. So well, that would imply that his blood pressure isn't adequately treated, and so we'll have to see. Uh, and uh, so when we looked at the stents, and we can uh, we can show you this study. So let me get to this study, and uh, we'll take a look. Hang on here. Uh, so here's our patient. Let's take a look at his heart. And so we're making the transition uh, from yearly spec scans with 18 to 22 millisieverts of radiation exposure to uh, CT when we think we need one with less than three 
millisieverts of radiation exposure, and hopefully we'll go lower than that if uh, we're able to acquire MVIR, which is reduces the radiation to that of a couple chest x-rays. So let's look at this, and uh, we can see some lumpy bumpiness in the artery. This here is the stent. So there's the stent in the LED, very proximal, and uh, here's the stent in the right coronary. So let's take a look at this carefully. We can come over here and we can look at his wall thickness. We can look at the aortic valve, left atrium. Here's the stent with a little lumen in it. There's the stent in the right. And here's our stent in the LED. Very proximal LED right at its origin. It, that was cutting it close to get that and keep that stent from protruding out into the main left. That may be why he was continuing on Plavix, but they weren't sure if that was protruding into the main left or not. They didn't want to take the risk that it was, so they left him on Plavix and aspirin because it's a really close, it's a close uh, mark there. I'm trying to keep that from doing that. And so, let's see uh, if I've got uh, magnification. Let's look for magnification. Here we go. There's some magnification. And now we can see, wow, that's really close. So that must be, that could be sticking out a little bit there. So if that were to thrombose the main left, it's all over. And that's a no-no to have it out. It has to be very precisely located. And so I can understand keeping them on Plavix with that sticking out in there. I can't tell how much. It's really, we don't have that kind of precision. So let's go look at some other stuff. And let's take a quicker, closer look at his coronary. So we'll bring this up over here. And uh, we will show some vessels. And we'll take a look at one of these. And we'll touch this one. And we've got a little bit of visibility of it, not entirely, but we will get that in just a minute. So the easiest thing is to take off a piece of this so we can get under there. So let's bring this around and bring this around and get some of that off of there so we can look inside there better. And then I can actually put this stent up there so we can see it better. So let's start start up this way and see if it's going to show us. Yeah, it shows us the proximal stent pretty nicely there. So now we've got not the whole vessel, but we've got the proximal stent. Let's try to extend this and extend it a little bit more and a little bit more. And now we got the whole thing. So here we go our stented vessel. So let's look, check the stent for patency over here. And if I could get this to be less bright, there we go. Now you can see that this is the pathway of blood and it just streams right through there and you don't see any really, really dark spots. So that means that that's patent. We don't uh, actually, now you can see closer in terms of how it's situated in there. And it does seem that it doesn't go into the main left. It just comes up there close within a couple millimeters of the end of the LED. Looks like there was some calcium in here and some calcium in here and some calcium there. So there was calcium to start with before they stent it. And that stent looks beautiful. So let's go take a look at the right and see how that stent looks. So hang on. We'll get a little, uh, little look at this one. And here we come. So now we've got the right. We can straighten this up a little bit. And uh, we can see with the same level of intensity that there's no black spots in there. And it looks like uh, no attenuation, contrast, density uh, after the stent. So we don't think it's filling retrograde. We think it's filling antegrade. Yeah, and so that implies altogether that the stent is open. We've got two open stents, 
And so let's go back to the LED. And uh, further analysis we can make of the LED to see, does he have any vulnerable plaques? Are there any plaques that are at risk of rupturing? And let's take a look at that. And we'll make this bigger and we'll sort of color code it. And so we're looking for the red stuff, the fried green egg, egg with ketchup. And so the red stuff we see here is on the outside. It's not in a indentation in the artery. And so that's epicardial fat or epicoronary fat. And so I don't see any suspicious looking plaques on these vessels. And we can see the continuation of the right, if we desire. It's a big right, dominant right circulation. And there's the rest of the right. And it looks good. Then we go to the circumflex. And the circumflex uh, is very small and uh, almost not worth looking at. This may be what's called a first marginal vessel. And uh, it's computers having trouble tracing that. It didn't trace it at all. We'll try upstream a little bit. And we're just getting pieces of it. Let's try this. And let's try this. And see what happens. And so there we go. And so again, we're looking for convergent, divergent, double cones and necrotic core and all that stuff. And I don't see any of that. So. This is good because that means this gentleman doesn't appear to be at risk of having a cardiac event. I'm not sure he was ever at risk of having a cardiac event. All we know is he had some vessels and they got stented. And so we don't know how close that was to a cardiac event because he was asymptomatic. And then uh, we can do more distal on the right if we want to. And here we go. More distal on the right, and that looks pretty good too. And so let's go look at the rest of his heart. And so we're always interested in uh, viewing everything. So to view everything, we have to make some choices here. So let's look at his aorta, and indeed he has some aortic calcification and sclerosis. And let's see how bad that is. There's there's several areas, but there's an interesting plaque here. And so let's see if we can sort of center it and look at it in multiple views at one time. So here's the interesting plaque that we're looking at in the aorta. And I'll get this up for you. And there it is. And the plaque, it's calcium in the middle and then non-calcified plaque around here. And uh, maybe, who knows, there could be some thrombus in there, but there's an indentation. And the indentation where the contrast comes into a well inside the plaque. And that well then represents an ulcer. So um, another good reason to continue on his plavix and his aspirin is that he has aortic atherosclerosis that's active with an ulcer in it. And so this is actually worse than what he has currently in his coronaries. And uh, we'll have to see if we can tell more about this ulcer. We'll put a little marker on there. And here's the calcium you can see. And we can do this. And the ulcer doesn't look like it has very much necrotic core in it, so that's a good thing. But he does have an active ulcer, which means that, uh, here I'll show, you, show it to you this way too, and there it is. And so that means that he has to continue on Plavix and aspirin uh, because of that. So there's no interrupting, even if we did believe, which we do now, that the stent in the LED doesn't go into the main left, we can't discontinue Plavix and aspirin because of this. Uh, he needs dual antiplatelet therapy because he could get a platelet clump in there that could go to his brain and then he's got a TIA. So this has become interesting.
because we found something new on him. So let's go back to our slide deck because I think we've seen everything else. And uh, we're convinced that the Sten is open in the LED and alive and well. We're convinced he doesn't have any vulnerable plaques. Uh, he doesn't have any necrotic core. And so we don't see that as being a risky problem. And hang on here, and we'll get the next slide up. So again, we're looking at an open stent, and we've surveyed all the vessels for having problems, and they don't have any problems. So then, let's go down here. And there is our ulcer in the vessel. And then we wonder about his blood pressure control, because let's look at his blood pressure. And uh, this is a 24-hour recording of his blood pressure. It looks like something went wrong with the recorder from here to here. And then we got another recording, we got another recording, another one, and another one. But it looks like when he put it on, he must have gone to work or something. Because look at these uh, spikes that he's having all over the place. And so that we didn't, uh, certainly didn't divine that from looking at his previous blood pressure when he was in the office. And so this means that his blood pressure really isn't in control or, he, or else he had a bad day. And so it certainly correlates with uh, the LVH that we saw at 13. So basically the plan, blood pressure control, yeah, we'd like to have better blood pressure control on him. Maybe we need some more data on his blood pressure. So we're going to get some more data. You know he's on Losartan, which is a six-hour drug, and so we may have to break that into two and give half and half to get an extension on the Losartan, or else switch him over to a different ARB. And then the Playbakes aspirin uh, and statin drug, it looks like we need to continue that, even though he's probably one and done in his coronaries and that he doesn't have any active plaque. He has an active plaque uh, in the aorta, in the transverse aortic arch. So that's a problem. Uh, and then his weight, well, obviously he never got the memo about what he needs to do in terms of the metabolic syndrome. The weight of 240, physical inactivity, uh, sedentary lifestyle, and so something has to change here. So. There wasn't really a life, new life-defining, uh, attention-getting event that he had. He did not have a heart attack. He didn't have bypass surgery. He just had a couple of stents put in. It was asymptomatic. So he just sort of took that in stride and said, uh, we'll call it a day, and uh, never really got his attention. Uh, so let's talk some more about the next patient and uh, think about this one. Did we gain something by doing re-examining this patient? And we did gain something. We gained the fact by switching from SPEC to CT, we found he doesn't have any vulnerable plaques. His, uh, his stent doesn't stick out into the main left, so we don't need Plavix for that reason. Uh, he does have an ulcer and aorta, and so he does need Plavix and aspirin for that reason. We decided uh, that his blood pressure is not well controlled by 24-hour blood pressure recording and by left ventricular hypertrophy. So we got a lot of information from a lot of sources that I think better defines for him his coronary artery disease. As a matter of fact, after having viewed this himself, he feels like he knows a lot more than he ever knew about himself and his heart. He said, I just saw one little thing on the screen when I had my cardiac cath in 2012, and that was about it. So I think we gained something. So let's go to the next case and uh, talk about this patient. The, the fact is all cardiac CTs are not equal, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So this is a 54-year-old married Caucasian male who woke up from sleep with jaw, chest, left arm, elbow pain, went to the emergency room and had a negative workup. He had some increased cholesterol, was put on statin, and got enzyme, liver enzyme elevation and had to stop it. He got an exercise spec scan, achieved Submaximal, not too bad. 
we want to get 85 percent actually I like to get hundred percent it's much more accurate but he got 85 percent of a maximal heart rate and he had some minimal septal reversible defect versus artifact whatever that means and had a normal echo uh, and so we looked at his physical exam and his weight's 220 225 BMI is 31.4 so he's kind of a big guy he's on no medications so he decides he's going to go get a CT scan because that was offered to him. There's a special deal in a county away from here, $250. So he thinks he'll go over there. Well, it turned out that the special deal for his the work employer had was a special deal that was such a bargain that they were using an old scanner, 16 slice, of which there wasn't a lot of use for anymore. It was a radiology read, and we'll show you the study. So. Hang on it for a minute, and we'll get you to that study. Okay, can't get you this study right now. I thought we downloaded it, but uh, somehow it got glitched in the computer. And so that particular study was read as 25% LED, mid-LED 50%, diagonal 50%, circumflex 25%, right corner okay. And actually that study showed that they took the pictures before the contrast bolus got to the coronaries. And so... It's a non-coronary study. It's a non-contrast study. It's a calcium score study. Although there's no mention of the coronary calcification on the report because the radiologist hasn't read one of these before and this is his first stab at it. And they don't do this study and this is their first stab at that as well. They don't have a trained tech. And so this is not Largo Medical Center. This is another center. So it's not one of our hospitals. But uh, the study was very poor, and the pictures were taken before the contrast got to the coronaries. So he has this information and, and says, hey, things look pretty good, I guess. And so his lipids are 248, 276, LDL 153, HDL 40. That's pretty typical of the, our patient population. And uh, what to do next? And so we decided to do another coronary CTA uh, because his was not diagnostic. He received 22, he received actually about 20 millisieverts of radiation because they're, they don't have radiation reduction on the scanner that he went to to get the bargain. So let's look at this study and see what it looks like. So hang on here and we'll get to it. So here we are back with the, the real study, and uh, we can look over here at his heart and uh, rotate this around. Big right coronary artery, as you see, coming around this way. The left anterior descending has a bunch of stuff in it. In here, looks like there's also a misregistration and these are the lines of this of the slices where they're reconnected so one there one here which goes right through that area one here of the slices when they were realigned and then a ramus vessel or a diagonal OM1 OM2 and so pretty good definition of the anatomy so let's take a look at this one and see what it looks like in detail. And here we go with the detail. So this patient who was supposed to have, was billed as having a 50% lesion in the left hand to descending actually has total occlusion of left hand descending and a lot of clot in there. And so let's look at that a little bit more. Got some calcium in there that was, wasn't mentioned in the report by a doctor that's never done one of these reports before. And so as we go through this, you will see that there's a problem when we get into this LED where we have calcium and we have very, very narrowed area, probably occlusion. 
in that area if not pretty close to it could be some trickle through then we got some plaque that looks ugly in there with calcification and there we go there could be some trickle through it's hard to tell and there's a lot of red stuff in there so there's some necrotic core and then we can come up here a little more and so and you can look at the density of the contrast we get up here pick up the density of the contrast 408 425 and then as we come down the density is 89 density drops 42 57 so we don't we don't have contrast density anymore till we get to the other side 402 408 and we don't know if this is retrograde filling so we've gone from a 50% LAD uh, that in a study that was done very recently in uh, a center in Largo that doesn't do these with a 16 slice scanner with a report that doesn't tell you much to uh, what may be total occlusion or trickle through in that particular vessel and we can look at the other arteries that's only the LAD what's the big deal it's actually a mid LED and so here's uh, the right coronary looks pretty good and there it is it's a big right and then we can check the circumflex and the circumflex we didn't get a good picture there so let's go back over here it looks like it jumped into a vein here's the circumflex over here and that looks pretty good and here's the circumflex over here and that looks pretty good so compared to the other study which we weren't able to show to you we have uh, a total occlusion of the LED or a subtotal occlusion of the LED as opposed to a 50% well the study that didn't even have contrast because the pictures were taken before the contrast got to the coroner and so we spent $250 got uh, robust radiation but didn't get the diagnosis so it's a non-diagnostic cardiac CT uh, which you'll see a lot of in places that are not used to doing this procedure and uh, don't have a standardized approach and so let's go back to our slide deck now we've had this relevation revelation on this gentleman and so what do these two cases have in common and so we see guys are about the same age got uh, 59 and 54 both of them have coronary artery disease uh, both of them are in the medical system seeing cardiologists both of them are male it appears that both of them have the metabolic syndrome uh, one of them has LVH the other we didn't show the echo and so um, the other we don't know there's carotid plaque and actually both of them have some carotid plaque. I didn't show the others carotid plaque. And uh, both of them, they have had spec scans in the past and we're switching to CT. One got switched to CT, which was uh, un not a diagnostic test. Both of them may have undertreated hypertension and we'll talk about that later. And so it turns out one other thing they have in common is both of them are police officers. And so do you think that there is an increased risk of coronary artery disease in police officers is a big question. So uh, let's take a look at that and see if that's true or not. And so let's look at some data. If it is true, it would have significant ramifications. Well, there's a 35-year-old police officer who died of a heart attack. Well, let's see. He doesn't look like he's in very good shape physically. He certainly looks like metabolic syndrome. Uh, he's a big boy. And so what is it about policemen that we hear about they're having heart attacks frequently? Why is that? And so did you know that policemen have a 15-year less lifespan than the average American? Other studies have shown 12 years, that there's a 70 times chance of having a heart attack, 70 times on the job, that is, in pursuit of a suspect 
So we go from zero to 60. These people basically have sedentary lifestyles where they're sitting in a car patrolling. Uh, they don't have a beat that they walk anymore. Uh, they're sitting in front of their computer in their car and uh, basically stopping over here to get fast food to move back into position. Uh, and so, and then having to perform at a high performance uh, 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 in a short interval of time because all of a sudden they got to go do something or chase a suspect or something. And so, and a lot of stress. And so the average age when suffering a heart attack in this group is 49, as opposed to it used to be 54 in the average American. Now it's gone up into the 60s in the average American. And so the average cost of an in-service heart attack is between four hundred and seven hundred thousand dollars in two thousand five. So this is very expensive. And so did you know that, of course, cities are usually self-insured for health insurance, and uh, frequently there is in most states a presumptive law that says if you're a policeman and you were hired without heart disease and there was a physical exam done and it, was, it wasn't established that you had heart disease and if you acquire heart disease, hypertension or tuberculosis while you're on the job it's presumed that you acquired it since you became a policeman and that it's related to your work and the burden of proof is to prove that that is not so. So there is a presumptive law in most states that presumes that if you have a heart attack, it's because of your job and it's workman's comp, unless proven otherwise. And the burden of proof is to prove it otherwise. Uh, the burden of proof is on the service to prove that you didn't acquire it on the job. And so that results in a lot of uh, people having claims, uh, and rightly so, and a lot of money being spent, and actually the projection to deplete municipal budgets in about 10 or 15 years. So it's the same kind of projection that we have uh, frequently with Medicare, Social Security, all these uh, things that consider large patient populations and uh, treatment. And so basically, what are the risks? Why is this so? And so we've got a lot of stress. The same things keep coming up that we see in other first responders, firemen, which are also included, shift work, sedentary lifestyle, diet on the street, sleep deprivation, working several jobs. They can be on 24, off uh, 48. Male sex predominates in the industry, the culture, alcohol use, which adds to weight very frequently. So we've got increased risk of developing a problem. And uh, we've got the burden of proof on the city or the municipality. And we've got self-insurance. So that's a, a big formula to costing a lot of money. So they actually have a doctor usually or a nurse who's involved in managing this patient population. Frequently, uh, there's a lawyer who's involved in defending the city. And then there's a risk manager involved uh, in hiring and managing people and acquire and assessing the risk that these people have. And so let's talk about how we could apply cardiac CT to this patient population and what the benefit might be in the large group itself, not just an individual. So we discovered in this individual who's actually ready for retirement in the next six months to a year, we discovered that he does have heart disease. And uh, basically that would be defined as acquired on the job. And so he has a total occlusion or subtotal occlusion in the LAD. And so this has been useful at this particular point in defining where he is. It would have been nice to have this definition long ago and to have looked at age 40 or age 45 and uh, to have discovered plaques and managed them so that they wouldn't come to this end. And on the other gentleman, basically, obviously, he acquired plaques 2012. And uh, how did he acquire those? That's, you know, four years ago. So he was 54 also, about 55, 54, when he was found to have his plaques. So by that time, you've already got the disease. So it sounds like we need to reel back on this, go back in the 40s, 
and uh, find out if they are getting plaque and manage the plaque to keep it from growing. So let's look at that and decide is that possible and has that been done? And so here's a study called the Scott Hart Study that I think we ought to take a closer look at. And I think we ought to really have this at our fingertips because it's a, a, a landmark study. And it just came out recently in terms of later follow-up. And so it's a trial comparing the use of coronary CTA to standard of care. So everyone got standard of care, which includes stress tests, stress echoes, spec scans, echoes, all the stuff we do. Everyone got standard of care, but half of this group basically got a CT scan as well because they, they figured they can't change the standard of care. We just got to put something on top of it and layer it. So we may not see a significant saving in money in a short period of time because we did the other stuff too, and we spent the money above and beyond that to do the CT angiogram. So let's look at these and see. This is the multi-center Scottish computed tomography of the heart trial evaluating the impact of CT on patients referred to a cardiology clinic. Most of them were referred for chest pain. This clarifies the diagnosis with coronary artery disease leading to more appropriate use of invasive angiography and care management changes that in fact reduce the myocardial infarction dramatically. So this is over a three-year period. Both U.S. and European guidelines suggest several non-invasive tests for patients with stable chest pain, but there's little definitive or consistent evidence to recommend one over another. In fact, the U.S. guidelines specifically favor stress testing, reserving CT for patients who can't take a treadmill stress. And so that is true, and that's why the insurance companies won't pay for the CT. It's because of the guidelines. Of course, you know that I always feel that guidelines are not a substitute for critical thinking. And so let's see, what did we find out about this? Well, we had 4,146 patients. 56% were male. The age was 18 to 75. And so if we excluded those that were younger, we would have had even more information because this was skewed. Because if we got rid of the people that were less than 30, we would have gotten a lot better outcome. If we got rid of the people that were less than 40, a lot better income. Certainly women less than 50. And so, so we, could, we could, this is actually diluted. So the information we're getting, if it's showing something very positive, you have to realize it's actually very diluted. And so they were ram randomized to either standard of care or standard of care plus CT for stable chest pain suspected coronary artery disease. So I can't imagine suspecting an 18-year-old. But the follow-up time was 20 months. Our job when you look at a new study is to uh, put holes in it and find out how it holds up. And so patients in the CT arm had 64 slice, or they had a 320 slice, and uh, at three imaging sites. So there were three places, two experienced readers. Sounds good. They read them as normal, mild, moderate, or obstructive. And so they divided into two groups that were two equal groups. Patients were followed for an average of 20 months, so up to four years, and even three months to four to four years. So some of this group we didn't even follow up very long, so that's diluting the study as well. The rates of invasive angiography were similar between the two groups. 409 studies in the CT group and 401. So they looked at the CT and decided, who are you going to do an angiogram? Well, if you had a CT that's normal, you're not going to get an angiogram. And so, but if you had a spec scan that's a false positive, you're going to get an angiogram. So different people in the different groups were getting angiograms for different reasons based on this additional information. And so there were fewer negative, that is normal, cardiac casts. Because obviously we had a CT and we say, hey, it looks normal, non-obstructive, minimal obstructive, so why do an angiogram? So that's very interesting. Uh, and then, as we came over here, the, it turns out that negative casts were reduced by nearly two-thirds. So instead of being 60% negative casts, it was 21% negative casts. So that's pretty good. I don't understand why it didn't go down further. I don't understand why you had any in the CT group negative casts 
So maybe it was not diagnostic studies, maybe there was some calcium or something, because uh, it seems like if you had a negative CT, why are you going to do a cath on anybody? A study demonstrated the CT affected how patients were managed. For more, far more preventive therapies were undertaken in the CT group. As you looked and you said, hey, there's coronary disease, let's treat those plaques. On the spec scans, you said, oh, look, there's nothing in terms of flow. I don't know if they have coronary disease, but I don't see anything in flow reduction. So, hey, see ya. So patients compared with standard care was a marked difference in the recommendations on how the patients were to be managed and treated following the CT. So here we go. Angiographies, 409 in uh, the CT group. This didn't turn out as well because it's supposed to be moved over, but let's go see. So we basically have 401 in the non-CT group. We have preventive therapies. 283 got prevention, whereas in the non-CT group, only 74. So these are the ones they saw the vessels and they saw the plaque. These are the ones that they had negative flow studies or negative echo studies, and so they said, oh, you know, we're not, we don't have anything to treat. Revascularizations were about the same, and normal angiograms were only 20, and this is, um, excuse me, this is the CT group, and this is the standard group, only 20. And myocardial infarctions were 34 versus 17, so this is where it got dropped in half. So to correct again, uh, somehow we got this mixed up a little bit. So the management guided by CT yielded clearer outcome benefits from the median 50 days after the therapy initiation. The rate of fatal and non-fatal heart attacks was reduced by 50%. That's huge. We conclude that the changes in diagnosis consequent on CT led to appropriate changes in the selection of patients for invasive coronary angiography and the more effective implementation of preventive therapies which were associated with a halving of the subsequent rate of fatal and non-fatal infarcts. Wow! If we could do that in the United States, we would fill the stadium with people who we prevented their heart attack or prevented their sudden death. We'd fill the stadium every two months. That's a lot of people. This is the first trial to reveal clinical benefits through better investigations and treatments. Patients with suspected angina. So we, it's a study that actually, a test that led to better targeted therapy. Wow, that is that is a test that influences the outcome. And so the cost was actually more in the CT group because they were both the same standards, both standard of care, but one was standard of care plus. So the cost was $462 more on the CT group because you had to pay for the CT. Now, once you have this information, then you don't have to do the, quote, standard of care anymore in the CT group. You just do the CT. So then you drop the cost. This is the first trial to reveal clinical benefits through better targeting and investigations in patients presented with suspected angina. Wow, that is a home run. And so, in conclusion, we have reviewed uh, two cases of two people who work in the police force who are at a high risk of having heart disease because of their profession, who have been managed in the past with SPEC scans, and who had a switch from SPEC to CT because of the Scott study, which has shown that basically you can decrease mortality, have less cardiac casts, and better manage patients preventively with CT scan. We discovered that there's a difference between CT scans. You can have a CT in a center that's not used to doing it and get false information. In that case, false negative because it wasn't a quality study. Instead, we found instead of a 50% lesion in the LED, we found almost a total occlusion in the LED. That's certainly a lot of difference. We also found that Patients frequently are incompletely managed, and that is we're talking about the management of the metabolic syndrome, management of their hypertension. We discovered with the CT that someone had a plaque in their aorta, and, uh, and this plaque had, was ulcerated, and they needed to continue on their DAPT, DAPT, D-A-P-T. 
need to consider continue on dual antiplatelet therapy. We found people are still obese. Uh, people's cholesterol is still out of whack despite treatment. Uh, and the metabolic th syndrome, as if untreated, is progressive. So uh, we'll see how this plan works in these two policemen. And these gentlemen that we showed you are actually a pilot project about bringing CT scanning to this population as a method of detection and management of coronary artery disease to prevent the patients from having subsequent heart attacks and prevent the city from being projected to go bankrupt in 15 or 20 years because of this. So does anybody have any questions? Teresa, Cheryl, Christine. Okay, well, that concludes it today. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.